Hi, Rich Tarani here. We're in the TMC newsroom. Uh, today we've got Hunter Newby with us on our program. Hunter, how are you? Great, Rich. Thanks. How are you? Uh, for those of you that don't know, Hunter is the CEO of uh, Allied Fiber, a company that is uh, uh, putting a tremendous amount of fiber in the ground uh, as we speak. Uh, Hunter, how's that going? It's going real well. We're actually uh, building the new duct in our first phase. We're 97% complete now. And that first phase is from New York to Chicago and then down on to Ashburn, Virginia through Harrisburg, PA. Now, you had the idea to launch this company a few years ago. Was that, what, two, two years ago? Yeah, actually, the first concept was in May of 2004. Um, wow. And that was early days when I met with the folks from Norfolk Southern Railroad, saw the rights of way in the existing duct that they had. Uh, but the actual implementation uh, didn't start until early 2008. So it's been about two years, and we've been building new duct for the past seven months on the route. And what's amazing to me is uh, over the last uh, years, we've done uh, numerous interviews. We've had numerous discussions at shows, uh, Interop, uh, uh, other shows. I think I saw you at the CTIA event, and you've been in our newsroom in our old building, in our new building. and. It's phenomenal to see that just in the last two years, the major network operators in the U.S. have announced massive amounts of investment in uh, LTE technology. Yep. And they're going to need a tremendous amount of fiber, aren't they? Yep. The wireless carriers are all really in desperate need of fiber, not only in the metros, but also you know, in the places in between. And for the most part, with the announcements that, that the wireless carriers have made for their 4G technologies, whether it be LTE predominantly or some for WiMAX, um, they're not going to spend their capex to build fiber out to all those cell towers themselves. They're looking for other folks to do that. And that's typically the carriers that they go talk to in the transport business, folks that sell Ethernet transport. But even they don't necessarily build all of the fiber to the towers. They look to lease fiber from other people that have the infrastructure in place because obviously you know, the costs are dramatically reduced and you can get it on lease basis and whatnot. So fiber to the tower is a big dimension of what we're doing, um, only in that it's incremental to the core long-haul business, which is you know, so desperately needed in the U.S. as an upgrade to the legacy systems that were built 10 plus years ago. You want to go into that a little bit? Why is it so desperately needed? Why do we need an upgrade in fiber? There's multiple reasons, actually. Um, primarily, it's the need for fiber on a long-term lease basis, or what's called an IRU, or indefeasible ready use. Uh, the carriers that are out there today operating lit transport networks on leased fiber, um, some of those leases are coming due. And you know, they may find it challenging to renew the lease. In other instances, uh, carriers are looking for new fiber to lease uh, that they can match with the new equipment that's coming out, uh, particularly the 100 gig uh, wavelengths from equipment vendors that are rolling that out over the next year or two years. And that level of transport capacity is required to support things like wireless backhaul. Uh, we can't get to uh, 4G you know, across the country without upgrading significantly the backbone transport systems. And that's going to require uh, new fiber in a whole lot of places uh, for efficiencies and economies of scale. And then in addition to those things, there's really physical diversity um, you know, to the extent that you can get it largely from existing networks, route diversity, for just very normal, practical network, you know, sound business principles. Seems to me that this is an interesting time for us to be talking because this month is when uh, Apple has launched its iPad. There's a Wi-Fi version, but soon there'll be a 3G version, I think, uh, in the next few weeks. Yep. And I can just imagine how much bandwidth that device is going to suck up just yep. from, from towers. And uh, Google's going to have one out soon. There'll be Android-based tablets, numerous tablets that are Android-based uh, soon. So you just can imagine if a phone with a screen this big is right. doing that much damage to networks. Right. What's, what's the tablet going to do? Right. Because there'll be HD video, 3D video. Th those are the kinds of Right. apps that people are going to want to use. The secret stuff like what Allied Fiber is working on that some people don't necessarily think is relevant or necessary. It's the things behind the things, so to speak. There's an, almost an insatiable demand for these tablets and the iPhones, etc. But the individual users really have no concept um, or awareness of what really is necessary to make all of that work. That requires a lot of dark fiber, a lot of colo facilities, which, you know, 
being in the physical area of real estate side of the telecom business, all of this information or all of this uh, infrastructure should be neutral and open. Uh, and that's obviously how we conduct ourselves. That's our business. It's to be open, uh, you know, to allow everyone to come in on you know, the all access network. Um, this is so that we can support all of the different networks, both transport, you know, on a, the fiber based side and also wireless, so that these devices and the bandwidth that they need to operate can be made available. And this is a big challenge. The United States is a very large country. So geographically, we've got uh, proximity issues to deal with. And right now, they're trying to solve for those, the wireless carriers are, with 3G in some of the major metros, let alone 4G. So how are they going to get to 4G, and particularly when you get outside of the major metros to some you know, second and third tier areas along major transportation corridors, where most of the towers are still fed by copper or coax. And it's been made very clear that there has to be a shift to fiber-based uh, transport of Ethernet in order to hit the backhaul speeds to support all of these new devices. They, it all goes hand in hand, Rich. The bottom line is you can't have the device and the technology without the backhaul network. And at some point that gets down to duct and dirt right away. So can your customers uh, lease space uh, from your company to, to host racks of equipment? Yes. Our, our regeneration facilities, which are along the route, and they're spaced every 60 miles, which is a traditional location for uh, regeneration equipment on a long-haul system. We see uh, those facilities differently than the folks, you know, the carriers that built long-haul systems 10 plus years ago. Those facilities to us are really meant to be neutral, open, active, vibrant meet points so that it's not just for the placement of equipment on the long-haul system to carry that light great distances between major cities, but also for third parties to build laterals into that facility, such as to facilitate physical layer interconnections for layer two transport. That opens up rural carriers, so Arlex and, and other small network operators, cable companies, and wireless carriers, and also you know, education, university type, government, even state level, um, you know, security, safety, emergency networks, all of which can locate in our facilities along the route. And the benefit is that the facility sits directly on the fiber. So that from that point, any one of those entities could lease fiber in either direction and light it themselves, or they could just buy lit transport from one of the big carriers that's coming through there, thus facilitating and opening up, really, access to transport throughout the United States, which is going to break you know, the broadband backhaul bottleneck, not just for wireless, but also largely for rural broadband. And part of the, uh, I guess, the uh, excitement that I have for what you're doing is that uh, there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in the last decade in just fiber technology. Yeah. And I'm curious if you could just touch on some of those innovations. Sure, there's been certainly you know, a couple of big changes in the types of fiber that are available. Uh, fiber manufacturers continue to improve the fiber types, um, you know, basically pushing out all the impurities of the fiber and making the fiber better in a couple of different technical ways. Um, the problem, though, is that the new fiber that exists today has really been in the lab from a long-haul perspective, where the new optics that are coming out, like the 100 gig lambdas that we were talking about and those lasers associated technology, most of that's been trialed on fiber that's in a lab somewhere, in a warehouse. And it works really great on fiber on a reel or in some test area. Uh, the problem is that when you actually roll it out to the field, that new fiber type is not in the ducts that are out there in the field. Uh, because there hasn't been any new major long haul fiber builds in the US for 10 years. There's metro builds all the time, there's regional builds. Uh, but nothing to the scale of what Allied Fiber is doing between the subsea landing stations and, of course, connecting the major carrier hotels uh, and data centers along the way. So a big dimension of what we're doing is improving upon uh, access to newer fiber technology so that that new equipment can be rolled out. So the equipment providers will obviously be very happy about this, as will uh, anyone who needs just greater bandwidth. Absolutely. Right? The equipment providers are some of our biggest partners. We, of course, don't sell lit transport but we have a very symbiotic relationship. They're in the equipment business. We're essentially in the real estate business. We're selling a dark fiber product. We're selling a co-location product. We're even selling a tower leasing product on certain towers along the railroad rights of way. Uh, all equipment providers, dense wave, ethernet transport, uh, microwave equipment vendors for you know point-to-point -point transport and for wireless backhaul, 
all play a role in our community, which is also part and parcel to our relationship with the dark fiber community between Allied Fiber and TMC, um, where we can bring you know, the entire industry together in one place as a resource, and they can learn not only about these new technologies, but the actual physical places that they can deploy them. Um, so we help the equipment vendors tell their story to the network operators uh, because the combination of what it is that we both sell actually enables the network operator to, uh, to exist and function optimally. Well, thanks for the plug. I should probably tell the viewers that they can get to the dark fiber community by clicking the dark fiber tab at the top of uh, any of the uh, more than four or five million pages on TMCNet. Yeah. Just in case somebody is uh, interested in, in learning more about that community. Uh, obviously, the last uh, year and a half has shown that the government, uh, not just our government, but governments worldwide, have begun to realize the importance of broadband in um, stimulating growth in the economy. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, how does your company play into uh, the rural broadband market? And just as importantly, perhaps, is just this broadband stimulus um, package and goal that the government has been uh, talking about for the last uh, year or so? Well, uh, so a couple things, really. On a, on a national basis, the broadband stimulus plan, you know, we at Alley Fiber are very familiar with it because we went through the process in the first round. We had a couple of different lobby firms in D.C. We filed comments with the NTIA, the RUS, the FCC, the DOE even, regarding smart grid and how fiber relates to that. Um, but we weren't successful in our application for uh, technicality. We had no uh, historical financials, which wasn't a, you know, a prerequisite, uh, you know, in other words, you didn't have to be uh, an existing company to apply, but it seemed that in the final equation, we did. You had um, to be, in, okay. but, but understood. Well, I don't, I don't really understand that, and we can't get a straight answer. But anyway, separate and apart from that, um, as troubling, as problematic as that is, we, we only applied for our phase two, which is the Virginia to Miami build. Uh, we are building phase one, so it hasn't stopped us in any way uh, from executing on a primary goal. So inherent in our plan is really the scale and the structure. So. It's replicable. What we do is no different in one phase than it is as it will be in any other. So how we provide for uh, benefit to rural broadband is that the long haul systems that were built 10 plus years ago were really focused on major city pairs. There were no points in between of any interest. There was no rural broadband 10 years ago. There was no quote unquote rural internet uh, or a, a sizable demand. And there wasn't any wireless backhaul to speak of really either. T1 sure. or copper base was more than sufficient. Obviously, both of those things have changed dramatically. Sure. And the systems that were built 10 years ago weren't built with the physical attributes to accommodate for intermediate access to allow those different network needs to be accommodated. We have a multi-duct design. So our primary duct is the long-haul cable, and that's the one that you're not supposed to interfere with but for the 60-mile regeneration points sure. due to the nature of the optics. But the secondary duct, which is parallel, which we call the short-haul or longitudinal duct, is meant to be cut everywhere. So we can drop in what's called a handhole, which is essentially a box that's buried along the right-of-way that can be excavated and opened up, and a fusion splice can be made with a lateral fiber cable into that point. And then that short-haul duct is used to intercept through our 60-mile regen color facilities the long-haul fiber, which then goes to the major cities and internet peering points, et cetera. That simple design change that has not really existed ever before here in the U.S. on a long-haul long, long scale is what's going to open up all these different pockets so the benefit to us is that the broadband stimulus is occurring. The federal government has identified the fact that there's a problem. They, they've made it aware, but they, they don't quite yet have a plan, although they've allocated you know, at least half of the $7.2 billion thus far, and the balance will be allocated here in the next couple of months, probably before the plan is ever ratified. So $7.2 billion is going out the door to fund something. It's not part of a plan, but it's a lot of different pockets of things that are getting capital for infrastructure builds. So those are essentially islands. that are going to be new high-speed islands, and they're going to need bridges. And the allied fiber system becomes the bridge to connect sure. the islands. And that's really sure. how we play. But part two of what you mentioned before was the world. So the United States has its own um, way of going about this. <laughs> so there's the allied fiber component of that, and then there's the broadband stimulus component of that. And then there's other places in the world. And actually, on my blog on the dark fiber community, I cover this almost exclusively. Um, fiber infrastructure builds, both subsea and terrestrial, globally, outside of the United States. 
because actually there's more happening outside of the United States than there is in, which is frightening. Um, and as a matter of fact, maybe it's just a coincidence, but Africa seems to be doing the most as a continent um, in the world in terms of infrastructure build. That may be because of the fact that most of the countries in Africa are probably you know, the furthest behind in terms of broadband penetration, um, so they have the most catching up to do. But it seems like the concept has just really caught fire there. And there are numerous new subsea cables both on the west and east coast of Africa, including CECOM and EZ and GLOW. Um, and there's also numerous in-continent, multi-country builds taking place, which seem very similar to the Allied Fiber model of using rights of way with a fiber core and then bringing towers onto that fiber to use microwave to distribute out into the outer lying areas of the country where it's just not economically feasible to bring physical area infrastructure. Also largely due to the fact that Africa, by and large, is now becoming a mobile continent. And this is because there isn't really any legacy infrastructure. Sure. Back from the old days of British sure. Telecom or whomever went and colonized and built you know, legacy infrastructure, it, they never continued to invest to keep up. And now mobile is on the scene. You know what's really interesting, Rich? The thing that's driving mobile uh, penetration is SMS mobile banking and banking. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually, I'm involved in a, a company in Ghana that does that called Africa Express, which I saw two, in 2006. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. And now they've partnered with Vodafone in Ghana to become Vodafone's text and pay service, which is actually the brand name, the service name of Africa Express. This is happening in almost every country sure. throughout Africa. So people are now subscribing for mobile phone service just for banking purposes, to, to settle debts with people and to purchase things, not necessarily for um, phone calls, although obviously that's an additive sure. component. And then with that will come web browsing and all sorts of other data. But think about it as a continent and think about the infrastructure requirements that, that they need and how they're tracking and the percentage increase that they're going to see going from a, practically a basis of nothing. And look at how many new subsea systems they have and look at how many new uh, you know, countrywide fiber-based systems they have. And then look back here to the U.S. and show me one that, you know, that has national level, um, you know, homogenous standard from an implementation standpoint. Not layer two, layer one, physical layer. There aren't any, um, to our knowledge, with the exception of what Allied Fiber is doing. Which is very exciting for your company. Now, why do you think that is, though? Well, I think it's partly due to the fact that the United States was so far ahead that it didn't see anybody else in the race. But then something interesting happened called Internet Protocol. <laughs> and that's not proprietary. And it's essentially a protocol. So once you read it and know how to write code, you can implement it. And then the, there became this decoupling of the legacy systems, the PSTNs of the world, and really the equipment that made that work and the decoupling of that moving away from circuit switch and TDM over to the OSI model and packet switch. So now you've got you know, hundreds of new equipment vendors globally, including companies like Huawei from China, that can pr manufacture equipment, all types of equipment, Ethernet equipment, dense wave equipment, voice over IP equipment, whatever, very cost effectively. And now they sell it to other countries, which almost used to be, not totally exclusively, but very close to exclusively, a North American phenomenon with Lucent and, and Nortel, and of course Alcatel, and there are others. Uh, you know, Fujitsu out of uh, Japan and whatnot. Um, with, with IP and with Ethernet, we could thank Bob Metcalf for that. Uh, with the combination of those two things, a lot of other countries now are able to build their own communications infrastructure and not have to wait in line for a new rev to come out every seven years. And since their countries are much smaller, generally speaking, mm -hmm. um, like a South Korea or Japan or right. the Netherlands, they don't have a large geographic area to solve for. So they can come up with a capital plan implement the plan and have the infrastructure to support gigabit speeds to the home well before the U.S. could. And also there's a level of complacency and there's a duopoly or whatever you want to call it with the telco and then the cable company. And, you know, we had this regional bell system. And again, a lot of this really comes back down to geography. Right. The problem is that no single carrier can afford to build the entire country from layer one to, you know, layer three or even right. seven at the application. It's just not possible. Verizon's humongous, but they only have a certain area. Sure. And then there's Quest, and then there's AT&T, and then there's some other ILACs in different pockets. It's not like it was for the first 125 years where there was one franchise Ma and Bell. the Bell, and they, it was subsidized sure. by the government through sure. escalated taxes to the people that paid their CapEx 
which is you know their infrastructure costs, which is how they maintain the infrastructure. Sure. When that all got broken up and deregulated, they said, well, now we have to fight with all these other companies to make profits. Sure. They started to shed the less profitable things. And there was a cease to investment in this type of infrastructure. We also have a model that's pretty unique. We can see the difference between the real estate component of layer one and then what others see as the network elements that get into sort of the transport layer, et cetera. We are very strict adherence to the physical layer business model. We know how to make it work. We know how to complete a, a neutral system that brings any and all in. And actually, that's a benefit to all these networks because it provides them for more access to other things that they otherwise wouldn't get. That time and place is now. It wasn't or couldn't have been five or 10 years ago. So it's actually good, yeah, for our company, but it's actually really good for the United States because we, again, will leapfrog all of these other countries for one simple reason. What we currently lack today, which is this homogenous system, can be built, and it will be built. And then when we have it, the, what is currently the detriment of geography, again, becomes our benefit. Those smaller countries can't get any bigger. A lot of those countries are maxed out with their population. All of their right. other resources, power, water, food, mm -hmm. agriculture, are limited. Uh, whereas in the U.S., we have plenty of room to grow. We just kind of solve for this problem. Um, and there's a way. There's a way to solve for it at the physical layer that will open up or also leave for the ability to open up in the future by just placing a new handhold along the route, an entirely new community, or to develop a new data center or a whole whatever, sure. a whole new regional network system that doesn't currently exist because there's no way to get out there. Sure. And Allied Fiber can help to provide the, the beginnings of a solution for that. Well, and what's going to pay for it is consumers consuming video uh, at home and obviously businesses needing more and more bandwidth. Yep. Video is a massive bandwidth hog and, and bigger, bigger devices that have faster processors, right, and better battery life and it's better really, screens. It's really no different than the history of broadcast television. If you go back and look at broadcast TV and how it came in on radio's turf, and you know how radio and newspaper sort of competed for a long time, and then when television came in, this new media, of course, newspaper and, and radio didn't go away, uh, but television was consumed, and then the entire advertising business was created as a result of it. And TVs that didn't exist in any homes all of a sudden existed in every home. But we had a different infrastructure model then in the country sure. with VHF and UHF and the, the airwaves and who had what. Um, and again, I, I also look at video a lot like I looked at voice and the PSDN and TDM. I looked at video and, you know, ASI and SDI, and then moving to HD, and now looking at HD transport over dense wave. Guess what? That's fiber. And HD over satellite really doesn't work. Uh, it can at a certain level for distribution, but uplink, you know, not necessarily optimal. Um, and all of that drives the need for new fiber, just as you said. And it's not going to change. Advertising is not going to change. Viewing video is not going to change. Um, you know, telepresence, which I'm a big believer in, it may end up just becoming, you know, Skype Brady Bunch. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, everybody can have it. Sure. But you're going to need a lot of throughput to sure. make it work. Absolutely. And that's all really, again, you want all those applications, it's just going to come back down to an investment in the physical air infrastructure. That's great. Well, Hunter, it's uh, been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for coming to the newsroom, and good luck with your initiatives. Thank you. Be back to see you again soon. Looking forward to that.